Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour is brought to you by Daniel Murphy, David Hayes, and Polar Inertia Journal, an outlet for artists and researchers documenting the urban condition at polarinertia.com. So what does it feel like living in Seoul, of all places, without a smartphone? Um... The maps would be useful, but I've lived without one for so long that I'm, I'm pretty used to it. It doesn't bother me that much. So. The maps are especially useful because how do you navigate Seoul, given the bizarre address system and the way the streets don't seem reliable? I mean, this is just my opinion as a newcomer, but it's not not that easy to get around Seoul, is it, in any sense, when you've just got here? When you've just got here, yeah, I would imagine. Uh, having been here yeah, 13 years uh, a lot of areas I know fairly well or uh, I'll plan out my route beforehand if I don't know but um, but yeah I can definitely imagine for someone who's never been here before it would be very confusing in some places for a high tech city you know it's reputed to be this tech capital it's a very folksy way you have to navigate right like Everyone's talking about turning left at the fried chicken place, going toward the mountain, going down this alley. It's not like, I mean, back in North America, if you know the two streets that intersect, you can get there. Here, it works a little differently, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, oh, why? That's a good question. I mean, I know going back to the Joseon era, it was simply done by neighborhood. But yeah, it was never you know, laid out in a grid form at all. Um, the grid form was pretty much laid out by the Japanese, who uh, in, yeah, enforced it, superimposed it very forcefully. Um, As they did many things very forcefully. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, you'd often have uh, sort of like four rows of houses, and then you know an alley going into the middle row every between every two houses or something, and and then it would basically they would have a a map of where everything was, and they just number it all. So the old addresses used to be this neighborhood, this you know bungee, this uh, numerical address area, basically a little section, and then like the number within that. So I, I, it must be difficult for the post office. Like, yeah, how do they do that? I mean, you can see why pizza delivery and such only goes in certain neighborhoods, because those are the ones they know. Like, when they get outside, it's going to be hard. Oh, absolutely. Um, I guess with the GPS, it's a bit easier now, but if you've ever been in, you know, uh, places that deliver food, you see they, they have the, the local map on the wall with all the addresses. Right, so. right. And this is the kind of city we're in, Seoul, South Korea Today on Notebook on Cities and Culture, where I'm speaking with Matt Van Volk the author of one of my favorite blogs on Korea. It's called Gusts of Popular Feeling. It's about many things, Korean film, Korean news media, both new and old, Korean history, Korean society. It's, how, what do you, how do you think of the mandate of this blog? Whatever I happen to be interested in at the time. But always Korea-related. Yeah, generally, yes, yes. Simply because you're here? Or was it? does it grow out of some... Would you still be wanting to write about Korea, even if you didn't live here? Um, well, it definitely grew out of just being here and trying to understand. Um, and yeah, if I was interested in something, I'd do reading on it, and I just started you know, writing about it. And um, just yeah, the results of my findings... There are certain themes that come up again and again on the blog. For example, <laughs> the way that the way that Koreans or the Korean media regard foreign English teachers here, if they seem to have some kind of psychodrama about this, how would you describe it? Um, yeah, that's it, it's definitely interesting. Um, in the research I've done, it, it really does go back to GIs. Um, the, the English teachers are sort of the, the new incarnation of the GIs. And, I mean, the, the relationship with the, the soldiers here was never talked about in the media uh, up until about the time of the Olympics. And then there was this explosion of anti-Americanism. And then any time after that that 
GIs committed crimes. It was turned into a, a, a big media circus, and they were portrayed as barbarians. And slowly over time, that kind of metamorphosed into the English teachers. And um, well, one of the things you know, with the soldiers being here, was in the early days, uh, a lot of the times they didn't even like to leave the bases. The one thing that would get U.S. money out was prostitution. And you know, there's there's a substantial number of soldiers who's probably mm, closest relationship with the Korean was. Right. Prostitution, and of course, that never really went well with the locals. Um, yeah, it's not going to. Um, and it was very, it was sometimes dealt with. There were some popular songs in the 50s that talked about these women, and they come up in movies and literature quite often. But um, it's still, you know, in the media, it wouldn't be talked about so much. But then as the 80s progressed, it became talked about more, especially crimes against uh, the prostitutes. What, what was it? Was it democracy coming in? Was it well, What made it possible to talk about in the media all this stuff? Uh, generally, I think democracy and the loosening of censorship. And, um, and a lot of it did have to do with the Olympics, uh, which came in right at that moment when a lot of the censorship was lifting. And uh, a nationalist media that they know it, they're playing to a certain audience. That right. nationalist they know this sells. They know it sells. They know the portraying Korea, Korea as a victim of outsiders is, you know, a trope, a historical trope that's, you know, taught in schools, and and it resonates. And it's almost the underpinning of the society in some sense, as Korea as the country that is a victim. Mm -hmm. That's certainly how the history has been portrayed, and and uh, you know, at the same time. Yeah, I think it's sometimes it's over exaggerated, you know, like the, the we've been invaded so many times. A lot of these weren't huge invasions. Right. You know, you can it still counts, still counts, still counts. <laughs> but but you know, if you look at a lot of the major wars, you're yes. talking about really a handful over five hundred years. I think Europe and most European countries would be happy to have that history up until nineteen hundred or so. Right, right, right. After that not so much. True, true, very true. But the English teacher thing, I mean it's interesting. I, whenever somebody I, that I didn't know at all before in Korea, a Korean, I, whenever I've gotten a conversation with them, they'll ask me almost immediately if I teach English. And when I say no, they'll be very surprised. Why is that? If they see most foreigners here and they don't look like GIs, it's just assumed that they would be English teachers. That's, and the thing is, statistically, I'd most foreigners here aren't English teachers. Oh, so it's not borne out by the numbers? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, well, it gets tricky. If you're looking at the actual visa statistics for um, the, the E2 language teaching visa, uh, maybe there's like five or 6,000 out of 20,000 Canadians. At the same time, the people who, uh, you know, Kyopo, Korean Americans, Korean Canadians, who are here on F visas, they can also teach English, but they're not, we don't know how many are. But at the same time, they were not generally talking about, we're generally talking about non Koreans and how they're perceived. It's, it's interesting because part of me, realizes that, I mean, I do plan to live here in Korea in a year or two from now, at least for a few years, and that's always the conversation, are you going to teach English? Well, I don't actually, my, my money comes from elsewhere, I don't need a job here necessarily other than to avoid the tourist visa runs thing, but, I, and it's generally talked about as a pretty good job teaching English, but at the same time, there's, there seems to be this underclass of the lowest level of English teacher who are sort of the, the bad apples, I guess. Like, they're not actually maybe, mis they don't actually misbehave maybe, but they get the, the sort of hagwon teachers, entry-level hagwon teachers, they, they get labeled as, I mean, they seem to be seen even among some expats as third-class citizens, right? To some degree. I, I think it's definitely still there. Uh, more so you know, 10 years ago, before they started to uh, at least put, you know, uh, criminal record checks and uh, degree checks, even though they're very cursory checks and they're generally just done to, uh, you know, tick off a box and, yes, check done. Why is it so loose? 
that's a good question. Um, yeah, considering it took a good two years once it became an issue in 2005. Uh, and the media started focusing on these horrible, horrible English teachers who do horrible things, and um, to the point of one documentary almost making them out to be like anti-Korean or, um, yeah, you know, even if they do get married, they'll eventually, you know, leave these women and cheat on them, and so you really just can't trust these people. Um, oh good. And you know, it's point, pointing out crimes and uh, uh, just how unqualified they were and. And it still took quite a bit of time. It wasn't until a, a pedophile who apparently never committed crimes here but uh, had committed crimes in uh, Thailand was eventually arrested. And that, uh, that kicked things in motion. But I find, you know, in some ways Korea can be very overregulated. Um, there's just a lot, not a lot of enforcement of these laws. Uh, if you look at traffic, I mean, you know, it, oh it, my God. it is illegal to go through a red light. You might not realize that sometimes. Yeah, in taxis, it's just like, you'll blow through five reds on a ride, especially if it's in the middle of the night. And it gets at something interesting, which is the difference in, you know, people back home will ask me on the internet and whatnot how Korea is different from America. And I'm sure you've got the question about Korea and Canada. How is it different from friends and family? And there's lots of obvious ways. You know, the food is different. I happen to really like Korean food, though, so I always describe it in glowing terms. You know, the, there's the whole plastic surgery thing, but a lot of the... One of the core differences seems to me to be the way that... The relationship with the law here. Uh, in America... And, I mean, the crime is probably worse in America than it is in Korea, but... In America, we have this kind of piety about the law, like the, ab the law in the abstract, its very existence ensures our well-being. Here, the law seems like a suggestion at best. You know, what I, how do you see that, the difference between legal culture and even, say, Canada? It's funny to me that there are so many Canadians here because the stereotype is Canadians always obey the law. Koreans might obey the law. It, you, know, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, I mean, there's different ways you can look at it. I mean, even going back to the Joseon dynasty, the, the law was something wielded by the rulers uh, against the people. The people could never look at it as uh, something that they could use to defend themselves. Um, and, of course, the laws weren't defined, and because you never knew what was illegal, then you could be arrested for just about anything. It was always something to get around, the law. And, um, and it just it was wielded very arbitrarily. And then, on top of that, um, you know, that's the Joseon dynasty is followed by the Japanese. And, of course, then there's a whole other, you know, reason not to obey the law or to stand up against it because it's unjust. And uh, so these sort of so-called modern laws are forced on Korea by an outside power, and it's you know even patriotic to stand up to some of these laws. And and then on top of that, you also have just the relationship with the police, and the, the police, you know, early on still kind of carried the the Japanese roots of, of being tools of power, of being very repressive. And uh, and especially by the time you get up to the 1980s, and you know the students being tortured, and they're, they're seen as being you know illegitimate, um, you know these wielders of an illegitimate power, and so you know people obviously didn't respect it. But then you know when democracy came, you know bit by bit that power is chipped away. They're they're not allowed to be abusing this power, and so they no longer sort of uphold the law. I mean, in many ways, they never did, but they're, they're, they're not as brutal as they once were. But since there's no longer that fear, people don't really feel... Uh, they're not afraid of police officers. They'll stand up, they'll push them around. Yeah. In their experience, as a people, the law is now, like, the weakest it's ever been, in a sense. In some ways. I mean, it's, it's interesting in that, you know, they're, it's not... A lot of laws aren't enforced on a regular basis. You have the crackdowns, you know. So for two months, we're going to enforce this law. And I remember ten years ago, they they cracked down on uh, cars stopping behind the uh, the white line in front of the crosswalks. And it was a wonderful two months, you know. You didn't have cars on top Did of the crosswalk. Everybody in Korea. <laughs> well, I just you know they they announced there was going to be a crackdown, so people are like, okay, we're going to obey that law now. Right. 
It's, I was at a bar not long ago with a bunch of expats, and I was saying, remember how back home in Canada or America or wherever, people wouldn't drive into the crosswalk if you were in it? And they were just like, oh, my God, I do remember. <laughs> like, that alone, it's... But the thing is, it feels like in Korea, and I'm sure the statistics say otherwise as far as pedestrian deaths, but it feels like they won't actually run into me. They'll get really close, but they won't actually run into, run into me. Whereas in America, somebody could just not be paying attention, or like a stop sign could be gone, and they wouldn't actually see me there. You know what I mean? That seems like a difference to me. Well, yeah, that's one of the things about driving is that driving back home, because everyone follows these set rules, it's very predictable and you become complacent. The thing with driving in Korea is because it's incredibly unpredictable. You never know what people are going to do. You have to be on your toes. So you're probably right in that people pay, hopefully, a little more attention. Yes. Have you driven a car here? No, I haven't. Uh, no, no smartphone, no car. Probably good ways to go. You get, you get a nice distance from some of the more uh, troubling parts of society. I mean, Tell me, tell me this. Uh, you, you, your blog, as as people will even just infer from hearing you talk, you have a sort of longer view into Korean history that's informing what you say about Korea today. Were you always a student of Korean history in some sense? Um, well, I, you know, I've studied history in university. I've always liked history. So uh, when I first came here, I. You know, immediately was buying books and uh, reading up on history, and even going to, even traveling to Thailand or Laos. Uh, I wouldn't be hitting the beaches. I'd be going to bookstores and you know, buying history books. I'm that boring. <laughs> what was the quality of reading on Korean history you could do when you got here first? Um, yeah, I mean, the, you'd go to Kyobo bookstore and there would just be a, a, a small handful of books generally. So, yeah, there, there wasn't a whole lot of choice at the time. Had you studied the Korean language at all then? Could you read it at all when you got here, or was that later? Absolutely not, no. no. I just, you know, slowly picked it up. Now, you, your blog itself got a popular feeling. That name comes from a quote by, I would, I would guess she was one of the earliest, earliest Western writers to write extensively about Korea. Where, how did you come across her? Who is she? Uh, Isabella Bird Bishop. She uh, she was a world traveler. Uh, she was British, and uh, she yeah traveled all over the world. Wrote many different books. Spent time in Japan. I think a little while before heading to Korea, and then over three years she made several visits to Korea. And um, at first she didn't really like it. She was like, it's dirty, it's... That's what everybody said in that era, seemingly before, in a time before the Japanese occupation. It's filthy, the people are superstitious, get me out of here. I mean, was she at first in that league? And so she was definitely, you know, a part of that chorus. But then on a return visit, you know, she noted, oh, like, wow, the city's been cleaned up quite a bit. And she, was, she became impressed. And she, she got to meet quite a few Korean people, and, and uh, the, it definitely grew on her. When was that second visit, the one where she liked it? What year was it? What, you know, era was that? How much difference was it between the first and second? Well, basically, she made the, I think, I think it was three visits uh, between 1894 and 1897, so a very small window of time. So we, we think of Korea as changing fast now, but was it even changing fast then, or was it more her experience was just different? Um, I think it was going through changes at that time, especially after, after it opened up, um, and especially once you have... Um, you know, quite a few American companies were coming in and working, you know, getting contracts. And so, I mean, by, I think, certainly by like 1904 or something, you, Seoul has uh, a railroad going out to Incheon, streetcars, uh, you know, limited electricity, telephone, telegraph, uh, waterworks were being installed. So, you know, there were changes like that happening reasonably quickly. Do you have the full quote from which your title comes off the top of your head? It's a good quote. I don't. I didn't remember it exactly. But what did she say about the presence of gusts of popular feeling in in Seoul? Um, I believe it was uh, gusts of popular feeling which pass for public opinion in a place where it does not exist can only be found in Seoul. You have to think about it for a second, even when you read it. It's like, but then you realize. Well, I'll put it this way. What what to you does she mean by that? 
Well, uh, and okay, when she says there was a, a lack of public opinion, she was referring specifically to newspapers. So, so what we consider modern public opinion as created uh, through newspapers, through media, uh, didn't exist. And the thing was, they, they the newspapers started to become popular. The Independent started in 1897. So she was there. She witnessed it starting and uh, was impressed to see it, it happening. But, uh, you know, gusts of popular feeling. Um, Koreans will sometimes ask me, what does that mean? And I'll be like, name be Moonhwa. And uh, a name is a, a pot that heats up very quickly and uh, it cools down equally quickly. And Often used to refer to the Korean temperament. Exactly. And so I just thought that was a very poetic way of, of describing that. And, um, and, you know, the things I was looking at when I was first starting the blog, uh, like the Kwangju uprising or the English teacher uh, thing, like a brouhaha in the media, how that had blown up. Um, I just thought, well, that kind of sums up some of these things. And there is a sort of a pattern, it seems. Tell me if I'm correct or not, but, yeah, that, that whole sense of feeling bubbling up, boiling forth, and then subsiding back down again in a way that seems a little too quick to a Westerner. I think one example is, I mean, to use something talked about a lot, is the the sinking of the Sewa, the reaction there, which sent everybody back, as you pointed out in your blog, to the collapse of the Sampung department store in Seoul about 20, almost 20 years ago, which seems to the foreigner like two very, very comparable incidents. This one has created this dialogue of like, you know, are we, are we really in a developed country? Why are we so corrupt? Like, what led up to this? But to me, it seems like, well, okay, well, did that conversation not happen 20 years ago? Because more people died then. It was, in a way, the, it produced more dramatic uh, images. Um, <laughs> you'd think if it was going to get reformed, it would have been back then. But what, did the pot just simmer down quickly after that? I think so. I mean, I always find you know, the pace is glacial uh, of, of change like that. And uh, one thing, I used that title for a post about uh, changes in laws about um, regarding sex crimes against children. And I've kind of looked at that uh, because there's an incident where a girl was, was murdered in 2006. And it just, there was this great uproar and there was all this talk, we must do something, we must do something. And some cosmetic changes like um, putting wrist, uh, the wrist trackers or ankle, that was ankle trackers on people, uh, you know, that was implemented. But I think it still took a few more murders to happen before that. And so, yeah, a lot of the time it, it takes these little pushes and it, it takes a while to get momentum going. And I wouldn't want to say this kind of thing just happens in Korea because one seemingly clear analogy is to America, where I'm from, where how every time there's a school shooting, the world is like, why wasn't the last one the last one? And I think a lot of us kind of know the answer, which is that the guns are already there. We're not going... No, but nothing will ever make the U.S. government so powerful as to take away the existing guns, and there are more guns than people in America. Therefore... If the struggle has gone through to pass laws banning guns completely and the next school shooting happens, which it will because there's too many unrecallable guns out there, America's not really ready to find that out. You know, we're not ready to be here. That's not going to work right away. It'll be generations before the, they're, they'll stop happening. You know, is, there, is there an equivalent feeling in Korea? Just they're, they're trying, to avoid, trying to avoid some truth by not acting now about, say, the corruption, you know, even 20 years ago. Do you know what I mean? Um, There's something they don't want to find out, in a similar sense. I see what you mean there, yeah. the um, Well, I mean, there's a lot of just endemic corruption. So in the same sense, there's too much already there. Like, it's not... You can't really just pull that all out like a weed. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's more like uh, trying to pull a... Uh, a little straw woven into a basket out. Yes. Um, yes. It, it's difficult. Right. Uh, you have to uh, uh, unravel a lot of other stuff. So. Now, I called Isabella Bird Bishop probably one of the earliest writers on Korea and English. Is that actually true, or is there were there a pack of them back then, or how far back does solid English writing on this place go? Um, well, there were there were certainly quite a few uh, in the 1890s. Like by that point, you were having. Uh, uh, 
several dozen people, I think, uh, in the 1880s. I mean, one of the earlier people would have been uh, Percival Lowell, who's responsible in many ways for discovering Pluto many years later. Um, Out of many talents. Exactly. Now, how many of this crowd, how many were not just the, uh, this place is dirty type writers? Um, well, you certainly had quite a few who wrote like that. Um, sometimes publicly, sometimes a little more privately. Um, but I mean, uh, I find even back then there's a, a bit of a, for the people even who loved Korea, you know, it was never, un, you know, a, a 100% love I mean it was it yeah was, then and now yeah I mean you know uh, they, they were, I think generally you know quite a few people were, were they had their eyes open they, they could see the faults and um, some wrote about those faults more than others right so. I mean what what was Korea in the 1880s 1890s because we think of it as being completely third world as recently as the 1960s so in, in, in 70 years before that what were they finding these writers um, well you know not a lot of uh, like in Seoul uh, there wasn't garbage collection there was uh, you know chimneys over, very overcrowded houses chimneys blowing smoke out into the streets um, basically uncovered sewers on the sides of the roads, uh, the main streets going through uh, Seoul, um, yeah, just rubbish. Uh, Cheonggyecheon was... Uh, That's not what it was, what it is today. It, it was filthy. Um, though, I mean, even when it was first, um, when Seoul was first uh, settled and turned into the capital city, I mean, it wasn't too long before they had a discussion, what should we use this? Should this be a nice clean stream or should we use it as a, basically a sewer? And they decided it should be used as a sewer to flush everything out. So even Horace uh, Underwood, who died about a decade ago um, at a Royal Asiatic Society talk he gave just a couple months before he died, he mentioned the upcoming uh, uncovering of uh, Chang'e Chun and said, you know, they're going to return it to being a, a clean stream again. And he just kind of shook his head. It was never a clean stream. <laughs> this is the first time in history of mankind it's been clean. So, yeah, most likely. Mm -hmm. mm. The, this, I've, I've tried to read a lot, as much as I can of, as we say, English language writers on Korea throughout history. And, I mean, I also do a lot of reading of those writers on Japan, and there are a great many on Japan. By comparison, there have, the 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 sort of sharp writer on Korea is rarely encountered the farther back you go. Although, interestingly, you mention on, on your blog a guy named James Wade, I think is his name, who wrote a couple books on Korea, One Man's Korea, and then a second one. I forget what that was called, but it's... I mean, I expected more from those books than I got, but it was... In, those are interesting as artifacts because they're just, they're just a bit... S s Strange. I don't, who, who was this fellow, James Wade? What do, you, what do you remember about him? Well, he first came to Korea right after the Korean War in 1954 and uh, he did, a, I guess, about a two-year stint in Korea and then returned home, uh, went to university, came back in 1960 and lived here until he died in 1982, I believe. And uh, during that time, he, he wrote a great deal for uh, the Korea Times, uh, up until basically the dictatorship got uh, much worse in, uh, in 1973-74 and uh, censorship of the media got worse and so he stopped writing for them uh, as it kind of became more of a government you know, outlet in some ways. Um, but he, uh, I mean he was a very interesting writer in that in the stuff that are uh, that's in his books, he doesn't. There's some criticism of Korea, but often he's criticizing foreigners, especially you know Americans' takes on Korea. Ah, uh, yeah. And in one of the things he said, you know, the Koreans are called the the Irish of Asia, and, and he goes through and says, uh, you know, I, I think you could say they were the Spanish. You can make all these little comparisons and pick just about any country. And in the end, he said, you know. Uh, Koreans are, you know, they have a sense of destiny for their country and they're very prickly about, they're very proud of their country, they're very prickly when people criticize it and he said, you know, I think we have to admit it, you know, the Koreans are the Americans of Asia. <laughs> yeah, I see, he has these good observations in those books. 
But then a lot of the time, it seemed to me like he was just writing about how hard it was to get the right things from the commissary on the bass or whatever, or like stuff about Western classical music. It seems like he was read, a lot of times he would rather think about classical music than Korea. But an interesting fellow, I mean, does he, how much of a legacy did he leave writing wise in terms of just the reading material that there is about Korea? Is it, there's, I, I wouldn't, in mo- under most circumstances, call his books major books, but given the thinness of the field, maybe they are. Um, well, I mean, yeah, the thinness of the field, yeah, due to that, I'd say um, his first book especially is, is pretty interesting. Um, but basically, he has those two books. He has an opera that he wrote right. in 19, I think it was 69, he basically used his money to put on an opera here. It did not do well. Korea was not really ready for that, and he lost a lot of money on it. Wow. Worth a shot. Right. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's, I guess if you go through the Korea Times, there would be tons and tons of writing there. But otherwise, yeah, there's two out-of-print books and a few other little projects here and there. And it's, it's not like there gets to be that much more in the decades following him. You say he died in 82. There was... There was Simon Winchester's book on Korea in, like, the later 80s. There was a fellow named Clive Leatherdale. Have you read his book? It's called May You Dream of Pigs. I've heard of it, but no, I haven't read it, actually. And there's about 90, 90, 91, a couple guys both named Michael put out books. Michael Shapiro and Michael Stevens. I think The Shadow in the Sun and Lost in Soul. I think from the same publisher. I don't know what was going on there. Have you heard of those guys at all? I haven't, no. And then I only bring them up just... I mean, the, most of these books are obscure to people, but I bring them up because they're some of the only ones I could find on Korea. My point being, there just haven't been that many books on Korea in English, have there? Well, I mean, it... On North Korea, certainly. Okay, yeah, in comparison to North Korea, yeah. I, I, I think there is a fair amount out there, but... Um, especially if you look on archive.org, even older books. Sure. Um, though, you know, some of them can be quite interesting to read. Um, others, not so much. Some of them are just blatantly, horribly racist. <laughs> yes. Um, that was the style of the time. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I, as I dig around, I do see there are quite a few books that I haven't heard of that I keep coming that I come across from time to time so there's probably more out there than people realize but uh, say in comparison to China or to Japan I think specifically of the Japan comparison like it's you can just shake the tree and a bunch falls off from any era you know even even now even though Japan's no longer the headline it once was there's a lot of writing on Japan why is it so much less or why is there so much less awareness of the writing there is about Korea, even among Korea enthusiasts? You don't meet a lot of people who've read James Wade, do you? No, no. And I mean, yeah, a lot of that stuff is out of print. I don't know if it's a matter of some of the more classic books. Uh, was it the Chrys- Chrysanthemum and the Sword or something about Japan? Oh, yeah, that, yeah that, that's one of the older ones. But, I mean, you know, those, those are probably still in print or easier to find. Whereas a lot of this, you know, stuff even stuff that I've come across about Korea some of them are quite they were just printed in very small uh, batches or you know, long out of print but um, certainly things like archive.org you know, can help you dig up some of the stuff but there's not that much ultimately of a coherent tradition of writing on Korea in English to draw upon when you're writing about Korea right I mean it's, it's sort of when you write something about Korea it kind of feels like you're not starting it over again but that it's not really a continuation of an existing thread. Does that make sense? I guess to some degree. Um, I, in my case, I, I kind of look to people like Wade or to some of the other... Or look to somebody, and he's, right. he might as well look to Wade. Right, exactly. So I don't quite feel it that way, but I could see how people would think that. You know? On your blog, you draw a lot from not just current Korean media, but older stuff. When did you get interested in reading the actual newspapers of long ago in Korea or just using, seeing, I guess, tracking changes in Korean society through media archives themselves? Um, When I was doing the research on uh, English teachers with Benjamin Wagner, who's a law professor, that I eventually uh, wrote a, a journal article with, um, he was fun to work with because since he was a law professor, he could call up 
you know, if there was some statistic in the media and I could look at it and say, no, that's completely wrong, he could call them up and so you could get results. And, um, Power and influence. And, um, and he's, you know, an excellent researcher, so it was a lot of fun working with him. And um, so, yeah, he discovered the, the Neighbor News Archive, so we started going through uh, the Korean language articles there. And uh, Robert Neff, who's a, an independent researcher, uh, he told me about the uh, Korea, Korea Times archives could be found in the National Assembly Library. So when I discovered that, I had a lot of fun. Because yeah. you can look for something in particular, but then since it's an entire newspaper, um, unlike the targeted searches on the Internet, you can go through and find all, all kinds of stories that you didn't even think of. What kind of things do you stumble upon that still stick in your memory as like, wow, I did not expect to find that in that newspaper? The, okay, one that just popped into my head was uh, from about the very early 1970s. It was, uh, I think he was called like the, the Rat King or the Rat Entrepreneur. But he, uh, he was a Korean man who was capturing rats. And basically, you know, I guess he had a small army of people that he hired. And they were skinning the rats and making like jackets or, or making hats or something out of them out of the skins. Um, yeah, just bizarre stories. Like, okay, I did not expect to read that today. Not reported as a bizarre story, just like, this is something going on. Well, as yeah, it was, you know, the entrepreneur, he's making some money, you know, sure. good for Korea, bringing in, you know, yes, yeah. yes. bringing in revenue, keeping the economy going, sure. What, what types of attitude changes as well do you see about... The way foreigners look at Korea, you know, 20, 30 years ago and now, has there been much change in the sort of in, in the way foreigners here regard the country? Yeah, it kind of depends. I find with the English teachers, yeah, they might be a little more likely to complain. I remember even reading an article and recently, and someone was complaining about how you can't get cheese here, and I just thought, well, where are you? <laughs> this was a recent article. Yeah, just like a, last month, and, and okay. Interesting. But um, at the same time, you have this whole new wave of especially university students coming here because they want to study Korean because they, they like the music and uh, they come here completely you know, pumped. And so, you know, that's that's a fairly new phenomenon. Of, and, and there's quite a few of them. So. It seems like the, the phenomenon of Korea not being a hardship posting in some sense is pretty recent, right? Until... I would say until 20 years ago, maybe until 15, 10 years ago, it was sort of Korea was not a, not generally considered a desirable place to be, was it? No, no. Um, definitely, yeah. For for soldiers being posted here, and for, for anybody, it seems like although it's you dug up, you dug up this hustler article recently, which was fascinating. Around the time of the Olympics, right? It was the thrust of the article being, you won't believe how easy Korean women are. I mean that. What would a hustler reader in 1988 even have known about Korea? Like, I remember the, in, in a clip from the article, they mentioned Seoul, comma, the capital of South Korea. Like, they had to even explain that. So when you see materials from that era, let alone in a publication like Hustler, I mean, do, do you think about, man, how, li how, sh how short, how small a knowledge base must those readers have been working with, you know what I mean? Yeah, I would imagine uh, maybe MASH. <laughs> it's always MASH, isn't it? Which I actually... Did you did you ever watch MASH? Um, a little bit when I was younger, but I vaguely remember it. Is it supposed to have accurately reflected anything about Korea at all, or was it just a, just a backdrop? I think it was just a backdrop. I mean, yeah, I'd be curious to, to look at it, but I know the, the original movie by Robert Altman was basically a commentary on the Vietnam War. So, so it was sort of irrelevant that it was... Korea was just a distancing mechanism. Yeah, exactly. This, uh, this thing in the... This, that Hustler article was not the last the world had heard of the Korean women are easy thing, that sort of meme. And it's, it seems Korea, Korea itself has done more to keep that alive by being angry about it than people have done to keep it alive by actually believing it. Does it seem that way to you? I think to some degree. I mean, that's partly what set off the, the 2005 uh, media uproar with English teachers where they were first kind of painted as being a problem in society was that a number of these teachers were on internet forums writing yeah, Korean women are easy and then netizens found it and translated the stuff and often you know 
poor translations, uh, sometimes a little more inflammatory or just just bizarre because uh, they, they don't didn't quite understand some of the English terms. But um, there's definitely a, a reaction, which is understandable. Right. But, yes, but I feel like you go on these forums and you could find name your nationality. You could be like, oh. American women, so easy. Ukrainian women, so easy. Like every everywhere you look, you're gonna find a, some guy and like a, a hundred guys below him on the thread backing them up. So why is it? Why? I mean, American girls are easy is certainly a meme in parts of the world. Why isn't America like fired up about this? Why is Korea so fired up about this? About the, their equivalent, you know? It's America doesn't seem to care about that. Korea cares a lot. Well, I guess America being the metropole and uh, you know the the most powerful country in the world probably has something to do with it. And Korea being a post-colonial society, in which I mean, I remember reading a Bruce Cummings uh, a chapter in a book on prostitution in Korea, and like what he saw here, even when he was in the Peace Corps. Um, but there's a just a quote from him saying, you know, like for so many. GIs, that was sort of the preeminent contact they had with Korea, and just the sheer number of them who had slept with uh, Korean prostitutes. And it's not like that wasn't unknown. Right. So, you know, even for a very long time, especially white males seen with Korean women would be, well, they might not be attacked. Sometimes they would be, but certainly the, w the women would be, uh, at the very least, um, criticized. It's, does it all go back to GIs and prostitutes? Is that the, the origin of this whole thing? I think in many ways, yeah. I mean, you do have sort of the Joseon dynasty, uh, you know, uh, conceptions of the barbarians, um, which were always cultural. I mean, they were barbarians because they didn't understand Chinese slash Korean culture. Um, but you, you would have this, yeah, uh, they're going to come and violate all our women and... Uh, that's, that's a difference as well. I mean, it's GIs and prostitutes. It's not like they're actually stealing women. They're not, they're not stealing non-prostitute women. I guess it was pretty much always actual prostitutes, right? With the GIs, they weren't, they weren't actually being... I mean, a barbarian wouldn't be engaging in a financial transaction. A barbarian would be just taking what he wanted, right? Mm -hmm. So, well, exactly. Yeah. Why, why is that not a meaningful difference to the Koreans? That well, it's like they were prostitutes. I mean, that's there's and they they were customers. It's sort of like it's formalized. It's not really like the GIs are sweeping through your village, you know. But it's still just indicative of that unequal relationship, and um, and just you know um, how there was no sofa to almost 20 years after the first arrival of America for a sofa to be uh, uh, negotiated. Um, so like the status of forces agreement, which would allow Koreans to prosecute GI's crimes. Um, because, you know, they're, they're, uh, I think compared to now, there, there was quite a bit more crime back then. Um, and a, certainly a far more of a sense of entitlement. And those, that's still within living memory. So when, when a certain generation of Koreans today see English teachers getting a bit too drunk, behaving a bit too rowdily in the streets, part of them sees the GI. Um, to some degree, I think. I mean, it's well, they, yeah, they see the, the white male, and and um, and of course, there's just the fact that they stand out. So. Um, but I mean, on top of all that is the ten years of this media trope of the out of control English teacher, which kind of feeds on top of sort of this base of of uh, the connecting it with uh, with the GIs. What are some of the other issues you see in Korean media that gets that get this degree of reaction? You know, there's the the old standby of the of the out of control English teacher, but what else? What else is sort of a button pushing Korean issue that comes up a lot in the media here? Um, well, I mean, there's lots of that little interests that, you. That interests me. Um, well, certainly there was the Lady Gate. I mean, there, there's always been. Um, one of the more famous ones was the incidents in 2005. Was the uh, 
the dog poop girl that Kate told oh, yes, I forgot about her. Yes, yes, she was... What was she captured doing? Uh, her dog um, took a poo on the subway, and uh, a bunch of people around her gave her Kleenexes to clean it up, and she picked up the dog and wiped its bum and then sat there and did nothing and then got off and kind of swore at these people. And, and uh, you know, people took someone took a photo of her and... Uh, photo of uh, old people cleaning up after her and that led to a, an internet witch hunt and um, and that you know there's a lot of commentary in Korea and a lot of that turned towards uh, we need a real name system we need to a lot of the powers that be were pushing this uh, in the name of uh, public safety and and um, uh, because she was hounded and had to quit her university and and all of this stuff and we have to protect people whereas a lot of it was the government wants to have that control sure and so that's a good mask for that, I guess. You know, we've got to protect you. Give us your names. And so, um, so they, yeah, they instituted that system and then recently you know, dismantled it. Um, but, uh, you know, you'd see some incidents like that uh, over the past few years. And then it just seemed um, a year or so ago, like, these kind of picked up and it was happening. And, it, and there was this, yeah, media cycle of this happening a lot. And then it kind of faded away again. But um, it basically these... And a lot of it just comes, I think, from... Because it's usually, if a, if a male transgresses in some way in a public place, it's, it's, you don't get the same reaction, generally. It's, it's almost... Because they're expected to? Like, oh, yeah, he's, that's, that's what they do. And I think there's just a, a lot of... And a lot of this stuff is, of course, driven by netizens. Uh, it gets passed around on the Internet. It gets commented on. The media then go, ooh, you have to report on this since netizens are talking about it. And that this is a big problem, too, with the media concentrating on stuff that's really not important. But uh, that's you know, the same anywhere, really. Um, you know, this is trending on the Internet, and we must report on it. But, uh, you know, I think there's a lot of, especially with you know, unemployment and economy the way it is and seeing women getting um, not equal but a more equal position in society is, is threatening and so yeah you have this kind of netizens lashing out at it and mm. yeah, it's one of those things that appears on your blog anti-foreign cartoons from the newspaper for instance that you translate how, how different does it feel how different do your I'll call it your two lives in Korea feel Life before you could easily read and and listen to understand Korean media, and life after that. Do they? Does it feel different to you? Um, maybe at first, uh, as I could understand more of it, but yeah, as time has gone on, I've just gotten used to it, I suppose. It reminds me of. Oh, I mentioned the, the writers on Japan that I read a lot of, especially the guys around the sort of World War II generation, Donald Ritchie or a um, Edward Seidensticker. And I remember Donald Ritchie could speak Japanese fluently, but could never read it. Seidensticker was a translator. Obviously, he could read it. And he would say to Donald Ritchie, you know, you, you, uh, you'd be as negative about Japan as I am. If you could read, you'd see the true, you'd see the true colors of the society. I mean, is, is there some sense in, which, sense in which you see the quote-unquote true colors of the society here if you are regularly reading Korean language media? I mean, I, you know, it, it, that's the thing. I, I could certainly be accused of focusing too much on negative stuff. And, you know, with the English teacher thing... Uh, with the English teacher stuff, well, obviously, it's a little more interesting to write about the negative stuff, but it's also, there really isn't a lot of positive stuff. There are the occasional, like, oh, look at this nice English teacher, or English teacher saves someone from drowning. I'm sure there's that occasionally, or most of the articles would be about, um, you know, uh, this school district has just hired a bunch of native-speaking teachers, which is spoken of in the same terms as, you know, uh, they just ordered a, got an order of flat-screen TVs. <laughs> yes. uh, it's a, it's a, a form of technology they're bringing into the school. Um, so it's very neutral. Um, but, I mean, so, yeah, that's one kind of worry I have, that people get a negative view from the stuff I translate. Whereas I'm... Uh, I don't really have... Yeah, I don't have a, such a negative view. Um, that, that's just one little aspect of Korea. It's so. only one aspect of your blog as well. I mean, you write as well about the built environment of Seoul, which has changed how since you got here 13 years ago? 
Um, a lot. I mean, I, I first lived in Buchan, and at the time, um, I mean, Buchan in the 70s kind of grew up as an industrial city uh, around the railroad and uh, the road to Incheon. And uh, in about 1988 or so, they started building a, a new town, or a, a shindoshi, a new city, and uh, put in all these apartments. And that's the area I lived in, but they hadn't quite finished. They were still building a whole section. So when I first moved to the neighborhood, um, off in the distance were you know, apartments slowly going up, and then the area where uh, is, it's now about a 12-lane road, it was uh, just a two-lane road and uh, just flat ground on either side. And two years later, my friend said, oh, I'm living over here now. I thought, oh, okay. And I went over and just could not believe my eyes. There was just a whole city here now. Um, the, the, yeah, just the changes. Uh, I remember a, a comment by uh, Valerie Galazzo, a uh, uh, French writer about um, basically the specific soul um, as... Um, as a subject of urban change, uh, she describes Seoul as a very plastic city, mm. and uh, it is very mutable. It's constantly changing. Um, Why has stayed the same? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, yeah, I mean, there, there's still lots of neighborhoods, these neighborhoods with villas that haven't been touched. Um, but that's a tricky one. I mean, just in so many, even just the neighborhood I live in. Um, even from little things like putting in um, LED lights for the, the crosswalks and the street lights, or uh, completely revamping the, the sewer system, or road improvements, uh, changing all the street names. Um, yeah, it's much easier to talk about the things that have changed than to try and conceive of the things that haven't. You, like me, enjoy Korean films from sort of previous times, 60s, 70s, 50s, around then, 80s as well. What, when you see Seoul in these older movies, does it, what does it look like to you? I mean, if you look around, say, Jongno Oga, there, there are parts of the city that do look somewhat the same. Obviously, there's more advertising. Or, um, and you can still pick out these landmarks, but you generally don't see all these apartment buildings. Or... Sometimes in the movies you do see these yeah, nascent, just starting to be built, but um, looking non-dilapidated. But it's yeah, a much uh, a lower skyline generally, and at the same time you do see the development that was happening in the 60s, like the the building of the Chang'e, covering of Chang'e Chun, and the building of the Chang'e uh, Expressway. Um, just how modern these were. So a lot of these buildings that are now we're quite used to or getting kind of old we're considered very new at the time and we're highlighted in the movies and you know we need this scene driving down this raised expressway uh, so yeah what are some movies that really give you insight into how Korea was before I mean they could be from any previous era but what are, what's a film or two that you've watched and it really seems to give you insights as rich as a history book could about how Korea has changed or even just the state that it was in long before you got here? Uh, well, one of the older films, uh, Sweet Dream, Mimong, it's from 1937. Um, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's quite interesting. It also basically deals with uh, criticizing the new woman, which is um, yeah, sort of uh, a perennial topic, um, but it, there's there's all these trappings of modernity. You 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 know they're drinking beer and they're hanging out at the hotel and they're having these nice meals and they're going on the train and they're getting taxi rides and and so that, that's that's a really interesting movie just just to see all of that background um, and see the similarities and the differences. Um, other movies like. Uh, I guess off the top of my head, Obaltan, that's quite interesting. Um, a very, very bleak movie. Um, As many are from those days. Yes, exactly. Um, but, I mean, at one point, I mean, it deals, you know, the, the character's sister is a prostitute for the Americans. 
the uh, his uh, out of work brother commits a bank robbery and ends up running away and fleeing under Chungaechon, which they're just covering at the time. Um, that thing plays a bigger part in the movies than I would have expected. In some ways, yeah, yeah. It, it is even yeah. Jia Yumanse, hurrah, freedom from 1946, as a character running under a bridge on Chungaechon. So it does yeah, feature from time to time. It's interesting that as well, you've mentioned these older movies to Koreans, and unless they're pretty hardcore cinephiles, usually they just have no idea what you're talking about, right? Yeah, I mean... There just doesn't seem to be... I mean, even with music as well, right? They're... You can hear that kind of stuff on uh, that older music. On you know, radio stations will sometimes play it, or um, with movies. I guess you can watch these movies on EBS or something. But there doesn't seem to be this celebration of that that older culture, which, or maybe I mean, I guess it's also a bit of geek culture in some ways, which isn't maybe as well developed uh, in that way. Uh, in Korea, as it would be in North America, it does take geek culture a bit to come along, doesn't it? I mean, I don't know what triggers it, but yeah, I, I've had a conversations with Korean friends. They'll ask me what a geek is, or even what a nerd is. Though those are two, two different things. I guess they don't have those here. It's, those aren't like concepts with a lot of traction. There's people who study a lot, but there's no real nerd. There's people with hobbies, but no real geek, is there? Yeah, I don't think it's it's yeah thought of in those same terms as as we would think of it, and I, and I think one of the problems too is that so much of that culture was suppressed. Uh, you know, there's just the film censorship and the merging of uh, film companies and the banning of music and arrest of all these musicians and all in the mid 1970s at the height of the dictatorship. Um, that I mean, a lot of stuff was lost. You know, the Shin Jung Hyun. The godfather of Korean rock and roll. You know his master tapes are all lost. So to listen to them now, you have to, you know, make CDs from scratchy records. Uh, so many films were lost, but there's still a lot there. But there just doesn't seem to be a, you know, a celebration of it. And even like the record industry is built around, you know, sugary teen top, which. You know, in North America, is just one revenue stream. Usually, the the Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and these old uh, records that still sell quite a bit over time add up to make just as much or even more money than the the latest hit. But that doesn't seem to be cultivated in Korea. But at the same time, it seems like. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the older music and older movies are getting a little bit of traction again here. There's. By no means have they returned to the mainstream, but people are sort of, sort of starting to kind of look back here in Korea. Do you think that's true? I think, yeah. As as time goes on, and as you know, you have the film archive preserving this stuff and putting it out on DVD. Um, as time goes on, uh, I think there's more people looking at. It. There's more available. There's more stuff being preserved, and because it's being preserved, um, but there's. Yeah, still don't know how much interest there is. <laughs> right, uh, that can be that can be tough to gauge. But I, w- I want to know how much how much reading about Korea in English are you doing now? Are there more English language writers on Korea who are observing this place well these days, or does that situation sort of persist where there's still it's still not a hugely populated playing field? Well, I mean, yeah, there's. It depends where you want to look for it. Um, you know, there's certainly lots of academics writing about it. Um, but if you, you know, there's there's still bloggers. I, I think um, I was talking with Stephen Epstein, uh, a Korea studies professor, uh, about it about blogs, and he kind of said, uh, in some ways, Facebook has sort of supplanted blogging. So straight social media now. Um, I mean, there's still lots of bloggers out there. Um, I'll admit I'm kind of busy these days and don't get reading quite so much. What kind of questions do you do you want to see discussed in the writing about Korea today? What sort of what sort of things do you find really interesting that just don't get talked about that much in Korea or about Korea elsewhere? Well, that's a good question. I really can't think of much. Off. I mean, I find there's there's 
I find there's lots of these niches where people are discussing a lot of these things. Somewhere you can find a discussion of everything that fascinates you about Korea? I think so, generally, yeah. I mean, there's, there's you know, film blogs, there's music blogs, there's, uh, you know, you have a study of society, you know, James Turnbull. Um, who's, who's on this show, in fact. Yes, yeah, so maybe you'll be, maybe you've heard him on this show already, listeners. Maybe he's coming up. I'm not sure yet on the order, but certainly he's a good one. And, um, I mean, yeah, there, there's lots of people writing, and I think a lot of these niches are covered, so... Thirteen years into your time here, when what what questions are you asking about Korea? What do you find you want to know more about now, or what things have what things have become most fascinating to you now about this society? Um, I mean, I find these days I'm still you know studying a bit about um, sort of how foreigners are perceived going back into the past. Um, still interested in, in urbanism and the development of Seoul, especially historically. Um, and especially in you know the music, the pop culture uh, in the past. And as you said before we recorded, you may have a you may have some time coming up back home in Canada. Do you think this will be an, as, an instance of uh, reverse culture shock for you? I imagine it would be. Yeah. Have you gone back much? I usually go home every year for a few weeks. So. But it's not it's not changed as much as Seoul every time. I would imagine you can still you still know exactly how to find where you're going whenever you get back home. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What do you think are? I, I, I'm trying to think of a, the best possible way to put this, but. What do you what do you sort of gain from the contrast of experiencing both places? And I mean, do you want to do you want to balance out your experience between them? Spend more time in Canada, but still spend time here. How, how do you how do you want to arrange that ideally? I mean, I love uh, yeah. I mean, I love living in Korea. It's it's um, God. I do not want to use the word dynamic, but but. Um, Busan's already trademarked that for their slogan, Dynamic Busan, so legally you can't. <laughs> I have to be careful there. Um, it's just, yeah, it, it moves at, at a fast pace, and it's a, just a, a fascinating place to, to observe and to live. And um, at the same time, I, uh, I love yeah, going home and just uh, enjoying nature and just relaxing and, um, the, the slower pace. But especially living in the countryside, uh, that's where I grew up. But at the same time, I can experience that in Seoul. I have a mountain five minutes behind my house, so I can go up there and be surrounded by nature and actually a lot of history. Um, so I do manage to find a balance even just where I live now. So. And finally, during those stretches, you do go home. Do you, do you find you get writing about Korea done there? Because a lot of people tell me that's their experience, writers, writers about place, they write the best about a place when they go away from it, especially when they know they'll be back later. Has that been your experience as well? In some ways, yeah. I, I ended up going home for six months in 2009, and um, well, it helped that I wasn't working at the time. Sure. But um, but I spent that time somehow. But I, I I wrote a great deal. I did a lot of research about Korea then. Um, yeah, I think sometimes just being away from the place, uh, you can kind of look at it from a different perspective and uh, uh, think about the bigger picture when you're not always surrounded by the little things. So we can foresee a, a flood of new material from you if you do go back to Canada for a while then, I take it. Well, we'll have to see how, how busy I am, but uh, yeah, I'll, I'll always be writing and always researching and it, stuff. The results of that will be going up on the blog. So. Indeed, readers, you can enjoy the fruits of this on Gusts of Popular Feeling, the blog by my guest today, Matt Van Vilkenberg. Matt, thanks so much. You're welcome. This has been Notebook on Cities and Culture. I've been Colin Marshall. You can keep up with the cultural creators, internationalists, and observers of the urban scene on the show at colinmarshall.org. Thanks. And special thanks to all the backers of Notebook on Cities and Culture's Korea Tour on Kickstarter. Adam Hartzell, Aidan Nullman, Alfred Lee, Andy Cooney, Angus Gordon, Bala Chenupati, Cam Smith, Chin Music Press, Dan Caraselli, Danny, Deborah Smith, Emmett Ferriger, Humberto Grant, Ian Plosker, Ismail Kennessy, Jackie Gast, Jay Chang, Jeffrey Davis, James DeVito, Jonathan Filbert, Josh Paget, Kimberly Hahn, Manvir, 
Mark Hines, Matthew, Matthew Workman, Maureen Kincaid Speller, Monica Eck, Michael Fransky, MJ Pritchett, Patrick O'Flaherty, Patrick Park, Piers Rippey, Robert Salzberg, Samuel Hansen, Sean Brown, Themistoclus Crucis, Thomas Unterberger, Timothy Dobbs, and Wayne Wright. Thank you.